some words of wisdom. Sand, if you don't like sand, you're going to have a hard time in this medical school. If you don't like heat, this is the proverbial kitchen. And if you don't like pressure, well, don't worry, there's no pressure in medical school. So uh, in trying to come up with uh, something that I can impart on you that I think would be inspirational, I wrote down a lot of different things. I'll just say that I think the most important part and impressive part of the school are the students to the school and to each other. You'll get more from your friendships here. They're going to be lifelong friendships. Um, your friends are going to sustain you and push you and get you through hard times. Work on those relationships starting today. It's very, very important. The second most important is our faculty. Um, they're the ones who are supposed to make you work. They're supposed to be difficult. That some of them do things differently. There's no one way to learn medicine. And this is not Burger King. It's not going to be your way. <laughs> our faculty are notorious. The National Weather Service has named hurricanes after our faculty. So <laughs> become friends with them. So in searching for what I could talk about, I opened up a journal. Uh, and lo and behold, the Journal of the Medi American Medical Association, JAMA, in the August 28th edition has a letter. And it's written by a professor from the University of Chicago. And it's called Advice for a Student Starting Medical School. And I thought, <laughs> my talk is written. So I'm going to read excerpts from this with some, a little editing, because um, I think it's very instructive. Dr. Sifu, he writes, I sat at my desk trying to write a letter to the daughter of two close friends. I've known her since she was born and mentored her during her path into medical school. My intention was to write a letter as she embarked on medical school as I wanted to inspire her. But the words didn't come. And searching for the right words, I looked up, and there was this drawing on my wall. It had been there for 25 years. It was a gift from a patient. So let me tell you about this patient and this drawing and the lessons from it. I met E, the patient, during my internship in 1993. E was a struggling artist. He was homosexual. He was concerned he may have HIV infection. So after taking his history and doing a good exam, I recommended we do HIV testing to which the patient replied, not going to happen. We argued our positions on why this should happen or shouldn't, but ultimately the patient would decline. This became the script that they would reenact three times a year for the next three years. At each visit, he would conduct business, help the patient, write prescriptions, and then would recommend HIV testing. And again, the patient would say no. Even though he considered, the doctor considered these visits fruitless, he had become friends with E. A year after I completed my residency, he wrote, I got a call from E. He was breathless. He had been sick for a week. We met at the emergency room. He was admitted to the hospital, diagnosed with pneumocystis pneumonia, an opportunistic infection that uh, afflicts uh, individuals who are immunosuppressed, including with HIV. But the story has a happy ending as his pneumonia and his HIV were treated. His health and his immune system were restored. So back to that drawing that's on the wall and the three lessons that were learned. Lesson number one, often the most important service we provide a patient is not what we think. While, this, while I, again, the author, thought I was failing my patient, I was forming a therapeutic alliance that would enable that patient to reach out and trust me when he needed me most. Medical students don't know much. You won't make the big diagnosis. That's what the attendings are for. But you have a lot of skill that is very, very important. You'd have a great deal of, what, time, interest, curiosity, and really fabulous ideals. This is very important to patients. There's a story about a man admitted to the hospital with two problems. One, he was terribly sick. And two, he hated doctors. With a real passion, he hated doctors. So once they made him well enough that he could voice his opinions, he said he was going to sign out AMA. And that's not the American Medical Association. That means against medical advice. So. What happened? Well, there was a third year medical student that was on the service who admitted him, did the original HMP, saw him every day, wrote a note, talked to the patient daily. And while he hated pretty much all the doctors that came to his bedside, he formed an alliance with this third year medical student. She broke him. She talked him into getting the treatment that saved his life. And a few weeks later, he left the hospital alive. Lesson number two, much of what you are taught is wrong. 
Oh, oh the parents are in the room. Um, <laughs> should have taken that line out, Dr. Old, sorry. Your most committed and brilliant teachers will teach you things that you will later learn are in fact wrong. When I say wrong, I mean wrong. Some will be wrong at a later date because of advances in science and, not, and whatnot. Some are just plain outright wrong. Some, um, well, one of his mentors was in fact a great doctor, uh, a committed educator, a very smart physician, a well-rounded man. He taught him a lot. He says that, again, he learned more about medicine from this one man, but he also recognized that some of what he taught him was wrong. For instance, what he taught was that getting too close to patients was a dangerous thing. He taught me to never accept a gift from a patient. Six months after E's admission to the hospital, I took a job in a new city. When I told E that I was moving, we hugged. He told me he had a painting he wanted to give me. Rem remembering the advice of my mentor, I said e to E, I couldn't accept it, and then if I, he was going to force it on me, I'd have to pay him for it. He wrote, I'm embarrassed to tell you this story, because here was a person attempting to give me a heartfelt thank you with a non-monetary personal creation of his own, and I refused his gift. Uh, however, I was thrilled three years later when I came home to a large tube containing the drawing that now hangs in my office. E had given me a second chance to accept the gift in a way that I could not refuse. Lesson three, keep a sunshine folder. In it, you can stash your notes from patients, your pictures, great letters of recommendation, other small accolades of things that you've done for your patients. On good days, they'll be very, very important to you. You'll add to them. On bad days, you'll come to look at that sunshine folder and realize that life is not so bad. So you can't become overconfident in how good you are. You can't be too down about how bad you are because patients need you and they need you on a daily basis. That sunshine folder is there to, live, to lift your spirits when you need it most. So he writes, these are my three simple lessons to you. I hope they're useful. I hope this letter will give you, um, uh, that I hope this letter will live in your sunshine folder. I hope it will inspire you to do the best you can for your patients and hopefully not someday will you tell me that you thought my advice was wrong. So again, that comes from Dr. Sifu in JAMA, August 28th. I'd recommend that you download it and put it in your sunshine folder as you begin your education. Let me talk about these three lessons. The sunshine folder. I have a sunshine folder. I think most doctors actually do. Um, the, little, the little things that we're very, very proud of. So there are letters of recommendation, pictures of patients, their babies that they've delivered, the, the marathon they just completed even though they have horrible arthritis, plaques showing their gratitude, or their families. But I, I personally am most proud of the ugly tie rack. The ugly tie rack is in my office. Patients come and see you and ultimately they want to thank you. Accepting their gifts is a lot like accepting their um, compliments. You have to be careful. Don't shun them. Don't minimize them. Be gracious. Admit that the, that the gift means a lot to you and thank them. So I've received many, many ties over the years from patients. These often come from people who really can't afford to buy me a tie. Most of these ties are, in fact, fashion disasters. They are horrible, abhorrent. Um, and I'm not really a fashionista, so coming from me, this means a lot. Um, they have imprints of bonsais and giraffes. They are colors from another solar system. They're outdated. They truly are ugly. And when you look at them on this uh, coat rack of mine, it's impressive. So as ugly as they are, each of them was given with a great deal of love and thanks. And they're accepted that way, and that's why I never throw them away. So I collect them, I hang them on my coat rack in my office, I see them daily, and that's a good thing. It's even better when one of my not-too-well-dressed faculty colleagues is called to an important meeting or an important consult at the hospital, and they come into my office saying, I need a tie, I need a tie, and I point to the ugly tie rack. <laughs> and they go, Really? And, and they grab one and they put it on and they pray that no one is going to notice. <laughs> right? So that tie rack keeps on giving. Um, much of what you are taught is wrong. I'm not sure I agree with much. You know, there's a lot of things that change. And a lot of what I was taught was in, is in fact wrong. But finding truth in medicine and in life really takes time and education. And this is an ongoing process. It never, never ends. Medical education is hard, and you're going to pay for it with blood, sweat, tears, and an unwavering commitment to prove yourself. In my office, we have a clinical practice with a few doctors, a rheumatologist, and we 
we'll take in third and fourth year medical students for two and four week rotations. And during that time, we're supposed to teach them rheumatology. We teach them a lot about medicine as well. Some students are absolutely amazing during this rotation. Some are intellectual speed bumps. They're unbelievably bad. Um, and yet we give them the same effort and we try to whip them into shape. Um, we had one such student recently who was truly a lackluster in his whole life. Um, his write-ups were half fast. He shunned learning opportunities. He said he doesn't really like to read textbooks um, and he frequently uttered the words, I don't know. Um, and he had expressed that he's going into dermatology and he's destined for greatness. Well, my partner was his mentor and she was about to strangle him. Um, but instead she got mad and said, do you know what the difference is between a great doctor and a mediocre one? And he was sort of sh sh startled by this sort of uh, confrontation. And then he replied, um, uh, intelligence, compassion, listening, uh, uh, being prompt. And she, she, she looked at him glared and said, wrong. The best doctors have two traits, curiosity and never giving less than 100%. Somewhere that student was taught that being in medical school was good enough and that being a medical student was good enough. Obviously, that wasn't good enough. Lastly, again, that service we provide patients is nearly not what you think it is. That means, obviously, that there's a lot more than knowledge to being a doctor. I can, tell that all of you, I can tell all of you that by being here, by being admitted to medical school, you all of you are smart enough to be a doctor, to graduate and do well. The question is, are you going to be a good doctor, or are you going to be a great doctor, or are you going to derail? And a lot of that has to do with your personality. Patients, jobs, hospitals will come and go. The only constant is you, your attitude. Did you understand? How did you relate? Did you make an effort? It's not about the diagnosis. You have, what, one mouth and two ears. That's the way it's supposed to work. Great doctors are, in fact, great listeners. So I'm a rheumatologist. I spend many years honing my skills. I think I'm pretty good after 40 years. Most of us, amongst ourselves, we say, you know, I can make a diagnosis in 90 seconds. You know, I walk in the room, I know what's going on all the time. You know, it's, I, you, it'll, it'll take you three hours and you're still going to be, be half right, okay? But that's the way it works. You have to go through this, right? It's, it's the, that's the education is. Um, but I, so I can tell the patient in 90 seconds, this is your diagnosis, this is the test, here's the drug. The problem is 40 years has taught me that's not what they come to me for. They come to me to be heard, to be understood, to have a solution, and to get hope from me. None of that can be accomplished in 90 seconds. So you're going to spend the rest of your life listening to patients, helping them as they tell their stories. If you're good, you'll become a part of their narrative and part of their great outcome. In the not-too-distant future, you will hear the words, Doc, thank you for saving my life. Or you'll get a hug that will change your life. Or you'll hear secondhand that you did something wonderful for one of your patients. Four years from now, you're all going to recite the Hippocratic Oath. Hippocrates was a leader, a teacher, a physician in the 5th century BC. The oath speaks to a physician's obligations as a teacher and a leader and a student of medicine. When you recite it, you will be reaffirming or affirming your commitment to medical ethics, patient welfare, and an exemplary professional life. To be a great physician, you need to be a great patient, a great person. Well, if your physician becomes a patient, that's really interesting. But that's another lecture. But you do need to be a great person. And that begins here and now in Grenada. I really don't care about your past mistakes, and you've all made them. You made them when you were young and foolish. Those days are over. How you treat each other is how you're going to treat your patients in the future. How the people of Grenada perceive you is how your patients are going to perceive you in the future. So if you want to be a great physician, you need to be mindful. You need to be a better you. Your every action, your every effort becomes a, is a willful choice or a brick in the foundation of what will become your career, your life, your legacy. People, your family, your patients, they all want you to lead, to speak, to step up when needed. They'll want you to write doctor's notes so you can get out of jury duty. <laughs> a very important role you're going to play going forward. You're here for the responsibility and the accountability. So I want to end with a story from the White Coat Ceremony of 2005. There's a, um, 
so in 2005, I was doing the job of Dr. Schwartz. I was the MC. It was a wonderful ceremony. It was my indoctrination into the white coat. I got to be one of the rovers. It was wonderful. Fast forward nearly 10 years, my best friend from high school calls me on the phone, phone to tell me a story of hers that she had just gone through. Seems that she had to fly from the West Coast to the East Coast to Brooklyn to the Methodist Hospital where her aunt was expected to die. It was a hard trip for her. Her aunt lasted a week and then did in fact die. In the aftermath, Karen said that she was decompressing, she was thinking, she was a little lost in the moment. She stepped onto the elevator um, to leave and so did the internist who was taking care of her. She said, Dr. Sharma, you, you were wonderful. You, my aunt loved you. You were so attentive. You were so perfect. I'm, you know, we're so, the family's so thankful. And she asked, um, where did you go to medical school? And Dr. Sharma said, St. George's University. My friend said, well, do you know Charles Modica? He's a friend of mine. She said, you mean Dr. Modica? He's the chancellor of the school. She goes, yes, I know. Well, have you ever heard of Dr. Cush? She said, oh my, yes, I know Dr. Cush because he was a speaker at our white coat ceremony. In fact, he put my white coat on me. They both sort of were marveling about this coincidence that they were experiencing. But she then went on to say, as he put my white coat on me, he leaned forward, whispered in my ear, I know you're going to be in the top 10% of your class. She was stunned, rattled, surprised, excited. She didn't know if this was a prediction or not. But she went on to tell Karen how that became um, that moment, that encouragement was something that she drew upon as she went through the tough times in St. George's. So I really don't remember doing this, by the way. <laughs> so maybe she got me confused with Corey, but nonetheless, I'm taking ownership of this story <laughs> because it inspires me. It inspires me, it teaches me that there's not enough encouragement in this world, certainly not in medicine, and we as physicians, you as physicians-to-be, can do a lot more than diagnose someone. So I want you to know today as we put your robe on you and put the white coat on you, our hands on your shoulders means that we have confidence in you, that we have great expectations for you, and that we expect to hear your success story in a few years from now. Thank you very much.